what are thick wall cylinders? So we have, well, we might have seen them in our daily life or in our applications. And I wanted to put some pictures here in the presentation about what could be considered a thick wall cylinder. Because you might have seen or you're about to see in some of the following courses in your career something about, you know, cylinder calculation or, or thin wall cylinders or, or calculation of pressure vessels and sort of, of the sort. But there is a, tip, there is a kind of a characteristic that uh, differentiates what is a thick wall cylinder with a thin wall cylinder and is the relation that it exists between the thickness of the walls of that cylinder and the diameter of the cylinder. And that's what I have shown here in this slide here. So when you have this sort of, let's say, you meet this criterion, you can say that you're in the present presence of a thick wall cylinder. Now, it is interesting to know at this point that the ways to calculate thin wall cylinders and to calculate thick wall cylinders, uh, at certain level, they can produce, let's say, close or similar type of results in your calculations. In the end, we want to understand how pressure applied to the cylinder transforms into stresses inside of that thickness or that piece of steel or material of the cylinder. One th in a certain range, range, both theories or both approaches uh, might produce the same type of results or very close to each other, but at certain ranges, they start dif differing one from each other and it's better to use the one that is appropriate for your case. So in here, you have three pictures. For example, you have a hydraulic cylinder. This is pretty much sure popul popularly used in industry for different purposes, to, you know, for maintenance purposes, for installation of certain elements on machines or motors to remove or to mount equipment or to align equipment. So there, are, there, are, there is a diverse kind of a range of application of what a cylinder, a hydraulic cylinder can do, let's say. You use also hydraulic cylinders in a nutshell in a, to lift the car, for example, if you want to change the tire of the car, if you don't have this a screw type, you know, a crank or me mechanism, but, you know, jack mechanism, but, you know, sometimes we are using hydraulic cylinders for that. And then you have, for example, this oxygen bottle or oxygen tank, you know, used maybe in hospitals or even other facilities. You, you can also have this type of bottles or tanks in welding when you are, let's say, containing certain gases using welding or natural gas for cutting, for example. But then you have this type of fossil that this is another a pressure vessel or pressure cylinder. But again, you know, is this a thick wall cylinder? So that's something that, you know, we need to come back to this criterion to verify that we are in the presence of a thick wall cylinder. Now, it is important to measure that, mention that even though we are talking about cylinders and pressure, not necessarily we are talking about pressurized elements. No. So this is not exclusive to those tanks or bottles or machine elements that are kind of subjected to pressures and they're holding pressure. Not necessarily. I'm not going to show you in a few slides later what I mean for that because one of the most, let's say, whenever you are using an electrical motor in an industry or a gear box or a pump or any other type of rotating mechanism, you need to use one piece of element to join the driving force with the driver. So I mean driving, driving force meaning the motor and the driven force would be kind of a pump or a gearbox or, or any other rotor equipment. So, so when, and we are using that. And that's also considered a thick wall mechanism, a uh, cylinder solar, sorry. And that's going to be, I'm going to present it to you because that's a very interesting application. Now, the theory behind this is based on a field of solid, mechanical solids or solid materials, what is called, you know, the elasticity theory or elastic applications. And behind that umbrella, what we are going to need to use some very kind of, let's say, complex uh, theory called the Lame's problem, Lame, Lame problem to calculate this. I'm going to give you an introduction on how the deduction of the formulas to calculate stresses in a thick wall cylinder is done, but we're not going to go deep into the mathematics of it. So I'm going to just show you around uh, how it's done, what's the, uh, let's say, end goal with certain steps taken, but so we are going to jump at the end at what is the application formulas and how it relates to the real world. To continue with that, so we need to make some kind of, let's say, assumptions. 
first to identify what I have here in the figure. So I have a few elements. I have a, a cylinder with no ends. Just uh, take a look at this, that they, we don't have any ending here. Let me put it like this. So there is nothing closing the ends of the cylinder. So it's just opened there. Then this cylinder, we're going to, be, we're going to assume that there are an internal pressure applied with meaning from inside to outside that wants to increase the size of the cylinder. But we are going to have a, an external pressure that would, would want to decrease the size of the cylinder. Then we have the geometrical dimensions here, internal diameter and external diameter, or inter, inner radius, inner diameter or outer diameter. And then this cylinder is going to have a length. Assumptions, as assumptions that we're going to take is that, okay, as many of the in initial assumptions we have taken during the course is that the material we're going to be using is homogeneous and isotropic, meaning that it's the same all over uh, the extension or the volume of the material. There are no changes, you know, everything, all kind of, all the material properties are, you know, are the same across any direction, direction you can find in the material, and those properties are not going to change, you know, at any point. Second assumption is the plane transversal sections remain plane under the action of internal pressure. I don't have a figure now, but I will show you a figure later about what that means. And that's a huge simplification of the whole problem. You're going to see why. Third, uh, we are going, also going to consider, as also in many other st steps, that the material is going to be kept in the proportionality limit of the strain versus, or stress versus strain curve. Uh, which means that it kind of complies with Hooke's law. So it's proportional. So if you apply some pressure here, so this pressure is going to try to increase the diameter of the cylinder, but it will increase it without deforming it permanently. So it's going to be kept in the proportionality range of the stress versus strain uh, curve. And then kind of also this was taken into account when seeing curved beams that, you know, when you stress a fiber, you know, stress fibers, you know, independently. So it doesn't affect the other fibers, even though in reality there is, an, there is an effect of one fiber on top of another. But for the cases of this generalization and simplification of the problem at hand, we're going to consider that they are not going to affect the other. So if we select a fiber to study it, that we can take it isolately and say, okay, if I understand what's happening with this fiber, I don't have to worry about the effects of other fibers on this one, so I can freely work on that. And if I try to take, once, once kind of looking from maybe from this side here, and I try to say, okay, I want to take a small piece of volume, an elementary volume that's going to help me der derive all this equation. And that's going to look something like this. It looks a little bit complicated, but let me walk you through what's happening here. So I have taken this piece of volume, a piece of volume that, you know, if I see this from this side, kind of I'm going to see the whole circumference of the cylinder kind of marked like this. And what I'm doing is I say, okay, I want to take a look at a small piece of volume here. This one here, and then, you know, this small volume is going to look something like this. And I'm going to ask the question, okay, what should we do now? So, and this volume that is now drawn in green kind of is the same one drawn here, kind of in green, red now. So that's small volume that I have picked from, from that, circum that uh, cylinder. And I know when I take that volume, that volume is going to be subjected to stresses as if we were taking a cube, an infinitesimal cube to understand the stresses inside of, a, of an element as we have done in the, the first topic of this course. Then if I apply the same with the difference that instead of taking a Cartesian coordinate system, I'm going to, to use, a, well, it's not a spherical coordinate, it's a cylindr cylindrical coordinate system. It's more of a spherical coordinate system because I'm using three coordinates. And uh, these coordinates are going to be x, which is going to be measured along the length of the cylinder. I'm talking about this one here. I'm going to have theta, theta, which is it's going to measure kind of this uh, by the angle of the angle presented 
in the whole circumference that represents the volume for this case or the whole circumference represented by this part here so meaning that it's something that, that I can represent like this as an example and then finally we have the radial direction that points from the center of that circumference toward the kind of the perpendicular towards you know out out of the center of that cylinder or out of the cylinder now in the in the x direction I know that I'm going to have in the face representing the x direction which is this one and then I'm going to have kind of a stress presented in that face and that stress multiplied by this area would cause some kind of force by there then I'm going to have a radial stress in here and in here that if I know that if I multiply the stresses radial stresses or radial, yeah, radial part of the stress and to, with this area here I know that it's going to give me the force applied to that area there and look at this and in this case the, the radial stresses is one of the most interest one of the stresses of interest because it's the one that I'm saying yes uh, you have a stress here but a little bit later you're going to have a stress plus something else the same way we did it with the with the stress and strain or, or the stress tensor when we are studying it so there is something changing here so meaning that depending on where I locate kind of or select the my infinite my elementary uh, element kind of in the volume of the cylinder I'm going to have a variation of the stress meaning it's going to be different finally I'm going to have then the, cir the circumferential stress represented by these ones here and they're going to be perpendicular to these faces here that again if I multiply that circumferential stress with that times that area I'm just going to give me the circumferential force applied to that element now what these people do is what we have done in the past so we have a stress we have certain forces or loading case on that element I know that that element is a static case and if it is a static case it means that the equilibrium conditions must be met and the next step would be that well you need to have some say pre-body diagram because what's coming next next is that we want to understand how, what those equilibrium conditions are going to result or give me at the end so that's what we want to do we want to use this effect that this is not moving and all of these stresses and forces apply on the element have to be in equilibrium so i want to know what is the resultant of that or the result of that now Kind of to confirm why the radial direction is important to us is because in one of the specific assumptions is that we are considering that the deformation or there is only going to be displacement or small deformation a deformation but you know uh, elastic deformation is only going to happen in the y in the r direction kind of in this direction and of course we are also kind of this is an important feature that we are going to consider that there are no shear stresses presented in, in this elementary element which is going to help us later when we see how the failure theories can be applied to the results we're going to get because it's not enough that we know what are the stresses present uh, in this elementary volume but you know how to use those stresses to transform it into something that I could use a failure theory to determine if this element is going to fail or not at some point statically Great, and then we're going to see also a specific assumption that the radial stress is only going to depend on the radius r. And that's going to be critical because uh, at the end, when we plot the radial and circumferential stresses versus the kind of along the, the section of the, or across the section of the cylinder, we're going to see that that's the only thing that, that is going to matter to us that you know we can make a cut on the cylinder and then we can see how the stresses distribute across the section of that so and that's thanks to this specific assumption that we are not considering that the stresses are going to vary along the length or kind of a, or in the circumferential matter but just along the radio and that's going to make our life very, very kind of much easier then if at the beginning as taken that that stresses let's put it in the way for this case I'm going to change between you know that this cylinder is not closed so there is nothing kind of exerting pressure on pressure on this direction but 
we are going to end up you know, asking ourselves, well, what about if this, there are walls here? So should it be something here? So that's why I mentioned that it might be possible that we can have that. But the next step would be to analyze and say, okay, now that we understand that we, this is an equilibrium, so how can we postulate the equilibrium, let's say equilibrium conditions on this element? And again, I don't want to enter into the mathematics of it. There is a, a very consistent derivation and explanation for each step taken to get from one point to another. But the point more interesting for us is to know where are things coming from and then you know how to apply them to real sort of real life problems or close to real life problems. So in here, what I'm presenting to you guys is kind of the equilibrium equations for this elementary piece or surface taken from this element here. Considering that the direction in x is not important for me at the moment, that means that I could work only with the radial and, 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 and angular component of this spherical uh, coordinate system. And then, you know, it can be transformed in a planar case like this. And when I put together it's the, the sum of forces along, for example, the, the radial direction, which is this one here, I'm going to end up with this simple equilibrium e equation resulting from the equilibrium conditions. After I simplify things, and after I open up these parentheses, multiply all the terms together, kind of, and then subtract whatever is equal and organize terms, you know, I can end up with this. Then, the reason we started working with the stresses or, or the force equilibrium on an element, we know that that force, forces on an element cause stresses. Then stresses on an element combine with the material properties or kind of what is called the constitutive equation would relate stresses to strain. And then I'm now relating stresses to strain, but then if I have strains, I can then know the formation. It's kind of the first, one of the first lines we wrote in our first class that the whole purpose of, for example, of these topics is to understand how forces cause deformation. But you have to go from the process of having forces, for example, let me write it here again, having forces, those forces causes, cause stress on, in the element or stresses. Then you're going to have the material standing that and you're going to be helped by the material properties or constitutive equation, what is called. And then this is going to give you, well, if you apply these forces, you're going to have the stresses on a material that's going to give you a strain. And the strain is going to give you a deformation. Perfect. Now having that, so I have the Basically, the stresses caused by the forces. But now I could use strain, or I could use this part of the whole chain to understand what's happening there, because I don't have the whole information. Then this part here, this figure here, is important because it relates to one of the first assumptions we were mentioning there. And the assumption is that this one here, where is it? That plane transversal sections remain plane under the action of internal pressure partly because of that, meaning that this is only going to deform in this way, in this direction, in the radial direction. And then if I know that this is going to deform like that, kind of remember when we did the derivation for the curved beams. So we started with the forces applied and then what happens is something deforms. And then at that point, we started with this, the deformation of the piece, calculate the strain, and then with the strain, we were able to calculate the deformation, sorry, the stresses. Well, in this case, it's a little bit kind of the opposite, but now that we have the stresses, but now we have, we can relate what are the strains of this piece according to this type of deformation to what is going to be the radial strain and the circumferential strain in the sense. And both strains are going to be depending on the radius of the, or, or the radius because we're considering the radial direction as the kind of the only and main one affecting the whole uh, calculations or procedure. Now, this is also typical from you know, strain that now I can combine the material properties in terms of the Poisson's module and Young's module. So now I'm combining strain. Here you got it. I have the constitutive equation. Actually, we're talking about Hooke's law here. And then we have stresses on one side. 
So these are the equations that combine everything together or merge everything together. Now, if I keep kind of doing these simplifications and operations, I want you to focus on this. Kind of, I can introduce the concept of what were the values of what are the values of these strains and the strains in the radial and the circumferential directions to understand that you know the circumferential uh, stress, yeah, it's going to be going to depend on deformation of the of the element, and then or kind of I put it in the way that the circumferential and radial stresses are related to the material I'm using and related to the radial component of it and the deformation in the radial direction. So everything has so far seems pretty simple, but there are a bunch of intermediate steps that are not presented here. But this is to give you an idea that from one point of the whole chain, we could get you know a whole, let's say, combined relationship to give me kind of what would be the value of the stresses in the circumferential and radial direction. Because in the end, my sole purpose is to understand how to calculate these two items here. Now that I know what is this, kind of how to calculate those stresses, and I know also the these equations, by using certain boundary conditions, I can end up by saying that, well, if you want to calculate you know, the radial and circumferential stresses, you can do it by integrating this equation, which is equation derivated from the equilibrium properties of the elementary volume. And then, you know, by integrating a couple of times, you're going to get a couple of constants here. And that, well, actually here, and those constants can be solved by using those boundary conditions that I mentioned. And the boundary conditions are basically saying that the stresses in the area very close to the internal diameter is going to be pretty much similar to the pressure at that point. And that the stresses and the outer area of the Let's say of the element is going to be pretty much the same as the external pressure applied there. For example, that is to say that if I take this point here, I'm going to say that the stress here is going to be equal to this pressure here. And if I take this point here, I'm going to say that the stress, the real direction of this point there is going to be equal to this PB. So those are bond boundary conditions used there. Now, by using that consideration, we can find the values of both. This should be two. Sorry about that. Uh, the value of those constant integration constants, and then by substituting that into the um, main equations for stress, radius, stress, and circumferential stress, I can find the value of both terms in in a function of you know, the internal pressure, external pressure, internal radius external radius of the element, and then one variable. So this, each one of these equations is dependent on just one variable, meaning that by variating the radius on each one of these equations, you're going to have a distribution of stresses across the transversal section of that cylinder. That's what was kind of, that was the main idea of postulating those initial assumptions to have it in the term. Questions so far? Okay, we have not seen nothing kind of useful from the point of view of application yet. Uh, the next uh, slide is going to start maybe sh shedding light on that. Well, actually, no, it's the other next ahead, but this is important also. Just two seconds. Now, we mentioned that if the cylinder uh, is open in both ends, like we have been doing right now, so a cylinder open in both ends is something like this, with nothing clock, kind of, there's not a cap in each one of these ends. This would mean that there is not going to be, or, or these terms here, are going to be considered constant because you know they are not going to change. And if they, they are considered constant, then I can say that uh, this is very interesting. And it's interesting, let's say, characteristic that if I'm in presence of a of an opened end cylinder, the sum of the radial and 
and circumferential stresses is going to be constant across any point of the section. I mean that if you pick a radius or a radius value, you calculate the stresses there, meaning what's the radius stress and what's the circumferential stress. You add those terms and then you pick another point and then calculate the same. You're going to find out that you know you're going to have the same value if it's an open-ended uh, cylinder. Now, as we might be in the presence of closed and cylinders, then you know here I present you the formula for those purposes that you can use to calculate what are the stresses in that uh, longitudinal direction on the cylinder. Both cases are presented. Let's see one specific case. What about if the cylinder you are using is subjected only to internal pressure only that so there is no external pressure apply or is kind of negligible you just can discard it if you want so that means that the outer pressure that was presented in the formula is zero kind of these ones here these formulas are zero is, is zero and means that you know if i do the whole simplica simplifications i end up saying okay you know what if that's the case the radial stress is going to be equal to the internal pressure as you know as said before kind of as a boundary condition is going to be equal to that meaning that the stress here as you mentioned as you see here let me see if i sorry the stress here is going to be this one here this side here is going to be minus pi but then kind of to comply with the other boundary condition that at the end you have to have the radial stress similar to the outer pressure but if the outer pressure is zero means that this has to be zero here which it is as you know, presented here then you have the internal the stresses in the internal phase surface is going to be equal to the internal pressure and the circumferential stress is going to be the one presented in this formula but now with the exclusion exclusion of the outer pressure which doesn't exist in this case and then we're going to end up with this formula here which means that you know most basically the variation of or, or the maximum circumferential stress is going to be given when kind of you have uh, you are in the inner radius here on in the inner part of course but then it's, also, it's going to depend it's going to be a fraction of the internal pressure Kind of that is going to be multiplied by a relationship between the radius internal and an external radi radii in that sense. And then if you have a closed end cylinder, you can calculate how much is the the value of that longitudinal stress. Now look at here that we are working always with three stresses: radial, circumferential, and longitudinal. And that's because our spherical uh, reference system is you know has those three axes meaning that we have stresses you know, pointed out on those three axes. And most likely, as we are not using any shear stress in any of these formulations, most probably this would be interesting to see what is the relation that exists between these stresses and the principal stresses. Because if we wanted to use later some kind of failure theory, I would have to know um, most probably what are the principal stresses and those principal stresses are going to be produced also by the stresses we're calculating now but it would be important to start understanding what would be the relations between you know this radial spherical or radial circumferential and longitudinal stresses to those principal stresses now in the outer phase or surface when radius equals to the outer radius then i'm going to have that the radial stress is zero as i mentioned but the circumferential stress is going to have certain value here a small value represented here as kind of something and then longitudinal stress is going to be pretty much the same no matter if it's in the internal part or external part because of the assumptions we have made meaning that we're not considering any trans transversal deformation hence we're not going to have any kind of a strain on that direction hence no this is going, these two are going to be pretty much the same the other case is when you have pressure only on external sur uh, surface of the cylinder and if that's the case we can check for the boundary conditions first that in the internal surface you know there is no pressure hence there is no any radial stress because there is no internal pressure but in the outer phase we're going to have that the radial 
stress is going to be equal to that external pressure applied there, and as it can be represented here, kind of in this part here. And here, we're going to find that this is zero. So contrary to the uh, previous case where we only had internal pressure. For the case of the circumferential stresses, applies the same thing. The only difference is that instead of using internal pressure, we're going to use uh, external pressure. And it's going to be represented that you know, the circumferential stress is a fraction of the this stress here. So this is interesting to see because depending on the values, uh, well, most probably uh, the sum of the radius, the square of the radius between the internal and external radius is going to be always larger than the subtraction of the outer minus the internal radius here, both terms squared. And if that's so, this number is most probably be larger than one. And if it's larger than one, it means that this multiplied times this pressure, it's going to make me that the circumferential stress might be always larger than this one. And I'm seeing now a pattern where circumferential stresses might be larger than you know, radial stresses most of the time. Again, you have here the way to calculate the longitudinal stresses in case uh, you are working with closed and cylinders. Good. Next slide that I'm going to present is more practical. When I mentioned that, uh, not only this, let me bring it back, not only this type of uh, elements you could be looking for in case of thick wall cylinders or you know, these. Now, this definitely is not a thick wall cylinder because I would assume that this diameter kind of internal construction, you know, is not that thick compared to the diameter of the element to make it a thick wall cylinder. But I just wanted to represent there. Actually, I looked for some drawings, real world drawings on, on very high pressure cylinders. Um, even though they're high pressure cylinders, they are still you know, within the range of thin wall cylinders. So, so that's, that's important to see. But one thing that for sure you are going to be seeing as kind of thick wall cylinder are these elements here. Transmission, power transmission elements. Those are couplings. And couplings are used to uh, be mounted on, on, for example, if you have a motor, electrical motor, and you have a centrifugal pump, and you want to, say, ro uh, use the motor power rotation to move the centrifugal pump, you have to join them together. And one of the ways to join them is to use this type of Couplings. This is a coupling. And this coupling, coupling is mounted in a way, we're going to see a couple of pieces, I hope that they run fine, where they are mounted with inter interference between the shaft and the, the bore of the, of, the, of the coupling here. Meaning that this, the diameter of this coupling here, if I put it D, sometimes is smaller than the diameter of the shaft. So it creates an interference that, that kind of joins them together. Of course, they use a key way, a key here, but this key is not the one that transmits the power. It's more, than a, it's more of a safety mechanism to have it there. But most of the power between the coupling and the shaft is transmitted because of the very tight fitting that exists between you know, the shaft and this board here. Something you can see what I'm talking about is, for example, when you are going to design or select coupling for shafts, for motors, pumps, or gearboxes, or rollers, or any other rolling mechanism, or rotating mechanism, you have two ways of doing it. You use it kind of, I hope that you have seen something of this. I, I missed to check this, but I, I need to do it kind of, uh, I wanted to talk about this, even though if you have seen it before. And one is that you have a, a two type of way to, let's say, the, specify the interference between the bore, the, this, I call him bore, this diameter here, because it's kind of an internal diameter, and with the diameter of the shaft. And one of these kind of is either the coal or shaft system. And kind of let's take an example, this one here. So to make us an to make us a reference here, for example, when we talk about clearance between shaft and, and, and bore, then you know there is no nothing here. It's kind of there is nothing touching between one and another. However, when we're talking about transition, is kind of yeah, is something that is you know the diameter of the shaft is equal or a little bit kind of you know in, in line with the diameter of the bore. But when we talk about interference here, what we're saying is that the diameter of the shaft is definitely larger than the diameter of the bore, of the hole. 
and that means that you know there's going to be a compression of the shaft and a tension on the bore and sometimes when not designed properly this might fail or break and here in these figures that I'm presenting here for example this is a typical failure that might not be the cause because of the interference it kind of uh, used there but you know interference played a an essential role in kind of what's happening here you no know, the, the the failure causes might be different um, something fatigue related however if you have by just by having a shaft with kind of discontinuities as we saw so last that in last class i know that i'm going to have certain stress concentration factors apply here and those stress concentration factors you know affected by the variable load is going to decrease the let's say the capacity of this shaft to resist those loads and you know fatigue problems start but however if i have that stress concentration factor naturally because of the design of the shaft and i'm also adding the stresses caused by the inter interference between the the shaft the diameter the size of the shaft and the size of the hole then you know this is going to be multiplied by more and, and, and this definitely affects the whole system for example in this one you could see how it broke shows when it's not well designed such this is very thick so this this can be even i don't know maybe 25 or 30 millimeters in, in just in thickness and this might break this might definitely break if not taken care properly uh, for example this and this one here of course it broke in the weakest part which is kind of the the smallest part here of the of the this uh of this segment which it is the located the keyway here then of course this is one of the and in the corner actually it broke in the corner where there are stress concentrations applied there well yeah affecting that part also so it broke everything to, to have a look at on how they are mounted on, on equipment you can see these ones here this can look ugly but this is the reality of many equipment and factories so you see for example on the figure on the right look at the shaft diameter which is this one here then you have the bore this one here you have a keyway And look at the kind of the, the the thickness of this. So this is a thick wall cylinder or thick wall shell. And those equations that we have seen apply to these elements here. So meaning that not only pressurized vessels or pressurized cylinders, but you no know, this type of equipment that the good thing is that they are very well standardized, meaning that they can when you are going to you don't design couplings, you you select couplings meaning that you go to a table you see your applications see what are the availability of types of couplings depending on your application you are going to have certain tolerances about alignment between shafts or or let's say or in mounting or, or when it the because of the temp oper operative temperature shafts move you know get together or increase or, or or they just you know deviate a little bit then you know depending on that those characteristics you are going to select a type of coupling and then the manufacturer is going to tell you okay if you want to transmit this much power at this velocity and you know this is the coupling you need to use these are the restrictions that you have to take into account and this is the way you're going to mount it on the shaft meaning this is the interference you're going to have on the shaft meaning you, this is the the, this, the the recommended interference you know for for the mounting this to mount this coupling here so most probably you don't have to design this however if it comes time that you need to design such type of elements then you know you know uh, which direction to take. Questions so far? Now, next, I have this couple of videos I felt interesting to show you because, for example, in the first one, uh, according, I, I took them from YouTube. I put the links here. And uh, this is a roller, most probably for some certain machine or something like that. And if I wanted to try to kind of guesstimate the diameter of this, I would say that this is more, more or less about 500 millimeters or 400 millimeters in diameter. So if I wanted to bring this ruler here, so I believe this is more or less about 
500 millimeters. I would guess. Well, it might be totally off, but something like this. And imagine also kind of this small diameter here, the bore. It definitely is a thick whole cylinder, no? Because it come when you say okay, it's t divided by d has to be kind of what uh, larger than once over fifteen, I believe. Was it the the case? Larger or equal? Yeah, if that's the case. Then you know there's definitely a thick wall cylinder, and then in the video they say that they are or the guy who posted the video said that it has uh, zero point zero twelve inches of interference. So if I want to make a calculation of that, I'm going to use a calculator here, 0 0.012 times 24, 5.4. So this is about 0 0.3 millimeters of interference. That's a lot. That's a pretty tight interference. Now, in the second video here, I don't they didn't mention the interference, but they only mentioned that the, this piece here, they shrink it to 0 0.003 inches, but this piece here where they're going to slide this leaf is about also kind of expanded 0 0.3 millimeters. So imagine that, how to expand 0 0.3 millimeters. That's a lot of power energy needed to do that, a lot of heat needed to do that. But in any case, when you are in present of those cases, what's happening is that uh, when it's such tight interferences, what they do is that they heat up this part with, you no. Know, it could be there are different methods to heat up that part. You can submerge, for example, this roller into boiling, close to boiling oil, and then you leave it there for hours until the, it reaches the, the temperature you want it to reach, so it's, it, the whole piece expands. Or you can apply direct flame, and that direct flame is kind of, you, you grab a, a torch, and that torch kind of you are just you know you're going to see it in, in this video over here, but you just you know put the torch and start you know heating up the, the bore of this roller here. So that's that's a I have locally when I started working as an engineer, my my first work was on a machine shop on a large steel melting plant facility. So we used to I used to be an engineer where they repaired you know large large side equipments or really large side equipments and this was kind of a daily business for us and it was amazing to see every every time. Now, sometimes this is not enough that you have to, let's say, only heat up this, but you have to shrink this by frozen it, by freezing it. And what we're going to see that in this in this video they don't show it, but most probably they submerged this part into liquid hydrogen. Sorry, liquid liquid nitrogen. So they put it into liquid nitrogen and then you know they leave it there until it just shrinks. Or reach a certain temperature so that you can calculate you know how, how long you can leave it there by the size of the piece and kind of size of the piece and then you know how many shrinkage you need so you there is a table for to calculate that you leave it there and then when the time comes this is hot this is ultra cold and then you you can kind of say achieve those tight tolerances so in this case uh, they shrink they shrug they have used uh, let's say uh, dry ice to, to shrink this piece, and this is a very thin sleeve, so there's no not much putting it into liquid nitrogen might not be worth it, but you know, just dry ice did the case. So let me try play to play this, and let's see. Look at that, so it takes you. So look at how it looks this. Just extract it differently was what liquid nitrogen is the worst image in that piece there. A little bit south, little tiny bit south, yeah. So just imagine that to do that at that level of interference is something like it's amazing. <laughs> 
and in such distance is something that you know it, many things can go wrong when this doesn't go through as it should and it just let's say stops at some point it's very difficult to remove so you have to wait that the temperatures equalize and kind of that let's say everything gets to to the room temperature to start the procedure to remove everything again and that can take you know hours definitely let me try to play the other one this is longer but just wanted to see if i can let me see how can i This takes longer, but I wanted to. And I found on pages that they've described. So what we have here is a piece of it from a holder uh, for excluding plastic into some kind of container. Well, there is, a, there is a problem with this one because this is very long and I want to play that long. And then somehow when I'm recording the sessions, it doesn't allow me to, to jump to certain parts of the video. But, but the idea, I, we'll try to send these links by email, but sorry, Moodle. And you're going to see that they're going to torch this to heat it up and then they're going to bring this from uh, dry ice which is i assume is this in this container here this cooler and then they're going to insert it here but it's too long and then when i'm recording i cannot uh, let's say position this where i want so I, I, you don't have to see three minutes of that maybe worth it it's just a couple of minutes or one point one minute and a half anyway but this is pretty interesting and from the point of view of an industrial application of a real application because this is used and somebody calculated that. And in the case, for example, of this one here, uh, actually, when you have such dimensions, somebody has to calculate that. Or, or what are the criteria to calculate the interference of fitting uh, between this shaft and this roller? And it has to do that to understand that when this is working, what happens if for example, when working at a certain speed or rotation speed, uh, the roller stops and the shaft keeps transmitting the power. So definitely if the roller stops and this keeps rotating, so at the beginning it's going to, let's say, it's going to try to overcome whatever is inside and then it's going to try to, to break that the interference and friction and then it's going to try to break loose. So those are one of the main criteria used to calculate what's the interference because you need to decide how much of that situation transform into power you need to let's say to withstand and then you know that's going to give you the interference feed because interference feed is going to cause an internal pressure and internal pressure is going to cause a stress the stresses that we have seen already again this is kind of the two shaft and, and this is a picture from also from internet this is a rolling bearing or rolling, uh, the race of a rolling element or rolling bearing might be yeah it's a rolling bearing and then this is mounted on a shaft and in this shaft you can see for example there is a fit interference a shrink fit here and look at this finite element model tells you that hey in the area where the fits happen look at how the you know how how the mesh is populated but that mesh is populated in the way because there is something happening with the stresses there so most probably the stresses are going to follow even though mesh doesn't have to do anything with stress calculation mesh is in a finite element program is used to give you details of certain points on how to on where to calculate the stresses so you increase the density of the mesh in this area because you are interested to know exactly what's happening there most likely you're going to have increased stresses in this area but this is interesting to see kind of that even though this is not a direct representation of the value of stresses in this shrink fit but it is a very good example example on that something is, is really happening here in this section and uh, this formula presented here is the formula to be used uh, to calculate the internal pressure caused by the interference and the interference is represented by this delta symbol here so for example if you have those 0 0.3 millimeters of interference then it means that you know this is something that you can plug in here together with these other variables or parameters that you know kind of internal radios or external radios uh, basically those are the other two parameters needed because uh, B 
is known as it kind of is the external radius of your shaft or the internal radius of your the bore of the coupling in that sense. And then you can calculate what's the pressure exerted here. And if you have the pressure already, pressure that is exerted there, then you can come up here and calculate where is it, this one and calculate what are the radial and circumferential stresses across the radi across the section of that cylinder. So this is very well served to, to do that. And then you can verify against this type of failure. Then coming to what I mentioned about the theories of failure uh, and kind of the quick analysis we did on the values of the circumferential versus the radial stress. And yes, it's true, kind of if I take this convention that we have we have used before, that the principal stress one has is by convention, a selected one is larger than principal stress two, and two is larger than principal stress three. And then what happens with my three stresses in directions there? Well, it would happen that you know, my principal stress, the largest one, is going to be the circumferential one. As we are in absence of shear stresses, then right away I can relate according to the magnitude of those radial, circumferential, and longitudinal stresses directly to principal stresses. Now, you're going to see that the longitudinal stress is going to be the one in the middle, and the smallest one is going to fall into, or it's going to correspond to the radial stress. Now, having known this, let's say that you want to postulate the maximum shear stress theory, Tresca. Well, maximum shear stress theory says that you know, the material is going to fail if this is largest or equal than if the sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is larger, larger than the yield strength of the material. Now, the largest stress, circumferential stress, the smallest stress, radial stress, there you have the maximum shear stress represented by those stresses we have just calculated. Let, let's make a brief example just to go over without going into too much details, too many details. So let's imagine that I have, or we have a cylinder. Uh, we have an internal radius of 10 millimeters, 10 centimeters, sorry. An external radius of 15 centimeters. The cylinder is subjected to an internal pressure of 70 megapascals, so internal pressure. Then they are asking, okay, calculate the variation of the radial and circumferential stress across the radius and determine the maximum shear stress appearing in that thickness of material, let's put it that way. To solve it, I bring the equations I might need to use to calculate the radial and circumferential stress. And I only need these two because I know that, for example, they are asking circum they're asking the radial and circumferential, and I know that the maximum shear stress is going to be represented by sigma 1 and sigma 3, which are perfectly, let's say, calculated by these ones, the other way around, sigma 1 and sigma 3. So I don't need any other thing at the moment. So if I, wanted to, if I want to give answer to these questions, I need these two formulas, and then I need to know what's happening with these formulas, what I have and what I don't have. Well, I have the internal radius, I have the internal pressure, I have the external radius, and the external pressure, I don't have it, but I don't need it because this is going to be zero, because I don't have any external pressure applied there. Uh, likewise, this is going to be zero, and I basically have everything I need to calculate, the radial and circumferential stresses for this case. When I transform this or remove everything I need to remove, this is going to be simplified to this form here. These are the same equations, but not taking into account the external pressure and whatever it multiplies. Then if I do a little bit of simplification, meaning gathering you no know, common terms like this one here, repeats in here, for example, something like this, I can take them out, and then you know group them together and put it in this form. So this is a simplification of these two equations. It comes to this part that I can substitute the values. I have 70 
the internal pressure, which is in megapascals, and we know that megapascals are Newton over square millimeters. I have the radius, I have put them from 10 centimeters to 100 millimeters. So, and this is a square, meaning that it, this stays in Newtons. Yeah. And then, you know, external radius, also 16 centimeters, I put it in millimeters. This is square, uh, the same like here, millimeters square, again here. Then I have all the ingredients needed to, to calculate this. So this is going to be non-dimensional because whatever I put here as a radius is going to be millimeters and those millimeters are going to be in squares. So this is non-dimensional. And then here on the upper part, this square millimeters is going to cancel out with these square millimeters, but this whole part here is going to be divided by square millimeters. So I'm still keeping the results in megapascals. Now, the only difference in this case between the radial stress and the circumferential stress is one sign from the derivation of these equations. Then I went to Excel, didn't need any fancy program or anything, just went to Excel and created a couple of lines. I created, okay, what's the radius, uh, what's the sigma radial, radi uh, radial stress, and what's the circumferential stress. And then I wrote down a diameter from 100 till 160 and then I just input this formula in here and input this formula in here and repeat all of that for every single one of these and then after having these three columns I plot I plotted these columns in, in the same Excel and these, these are the results I have in the vertical axis the stress values represented in megapascals I have in the horizontal axis the diameter of the section of the thick wall cylinder from the internal diameter represented here by 100 millimeters till the external diameter represented by 160 millimeters. And you see here that the radial stress goes from a maximum value because there is only an external pressure, internal pressure applied all the way to zero. And this, this is because there are no external pressures applied. So this complies perfectly with the reasoning we are having uh, when taking the boundary conditions. Now, in the case of the circumference of stress, it starts with a higher value here and doesn't go to zero, but goes to a remaining part here. So, something here, which is pretty much coincident with uh, the figure, the figures uh, we had for this one here. So this is a special case, case where the cylinder subject is subjected only to internal pressure in this case. Now, I could have used these formulas, but these formulas are not are just for the maximum values, not for values across the section. I need to know the question they, they, they were asking in the problem was the graph, kind of the variation of stresses across the thickness of the, of the cylinder, but these this are giving me just one plain value, which are the maximum uh, radial stress and maximum circumferential stress. There are no chances here to variate across the radius because that was not the case, it was the maximum cases. But the shape of the figure of the dis stress distribution for the radial and circumferential parts are pretty much following what the Excel results gave me here. Now, to finalize answering the question about uh, what's the maximum shear stress on the cylinder of, in the cylinder wall, well, we are just apply the maximum shear stress formula where I just say, okay, the maximum shear stress equals to sigma one minus sigma three. This point here is about 155.28 megapascals, and I know that because uh, that comes from the Excel formula or Excel sheet. And then sigma 3 is this value here, and this value here is minus 70 megapascals because also calculated from Excel. Then to calculate the maximum shear stress, I have to divide that subtraction by 2 and giving me this result. Now, if I compare this result to the yield strength of the material divided by two. If this is larger than this, then this material will yield. And if this is not, then you know I can I can estimate a safety factor where you know this piece is going to this element is going to be working. Amazing thing of this is that there is a complex theory behind these calculations, but the application of it is straightforward. And you know, I believe we should be we welcome to those people who have worked tremendously to derive this equation and to validate them because these 
these analytical equations when compared to results taken from finite element anal analysis, they are pretty much consistent. Uh, and they're pretty much, in this case, these are simple equations to apply.